Heavenly Father, thank you for this time we can continue our study of the Christian home. A special emphasis uh, for the preview today is the study of the family and Christian principles in parenting. We pray that the Spirit will move again so that we can be teachable, we can be humble, we can follow the principles you've laid out for our lives, that we can be better kids, better parents, or better support for people who are in our families together in our community. May this all be done not only for our sake, but above all, for your glory. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. <coughs> all right, so I'll go and do a little, a little uh, uh, sideline here just to set up our study. These are two very, very um, spectacular pictures. The rose window is uh, a stained glass window in UK which is very, very beautiful, as you can see the intricacies of the design of a stained glass window. On the other side is another picture very similar to a stained glass window, but this is not a stained glass window. It is a special shot of the double helix of the DNA from Francis Collins, who is the father of the human genome. He's in charge of the human genome project. In other words, he, he, got, he got that micros... I mean, it's not only microscopic, there's almost an electronic shot of what a DNA is. That's the double helix. Um, Ravi Zacharias and, and, and Francis Collins gave a presentation in UK. And before Ravi did his thing, uh, Francis Collins gave the first introduction. And he showed these pictures. <laughs> and Ravi said, he did that lecture, as smart as he is. All he did was got his guitar and he sang a praise song. <laughs> he just saying, I was, I was just so overwhelmed with the greatness of God, so he had to praise God, right? So here's another picture that scientists put together. You have the brain cell of a mouse on the left side. The right side is the picture of the universe. There are at least, what, 800 billion more cells in your body than there are galaxies in the known universe. It's, just, it's fantastic. You know, and we're, we are so small, but... So, if you review, there's 23 chromosomes from your dad and 23 from your mom merged into 3 billion base pairs of DNA sequenced by God to form you in His image. It's one of us. Have those base pairs. That's why, you know, if you, if you want to have evidence that's beyond the shadow of a doubt, you have what we call DNA testing, right? When you test the DNA, you cannot controvert the DNA because it's right there in the basic cell structure of your body, okay? One DNA, a human genome is 3.2 billion DNA base pairs. It will take 96 years to read if read one character per second. That's how complicated it is. Now, a single strand of human DNA would fill a thousand volume encyclopedia comprising 600,000 pages with it, with 500 words on each page. So this, this is very mind boggling when I was reading this. But since I work with, with information systems, with computers, I, I came to better understand this in a little while. But let me just insert this. It's amazing. Uh, Psalm 139.13 said, For you formed my inward parts, you needed me together in my mother's womb. If you want to translate it from a human genome, genome standpoint, God put together your DNA code from 223 chromosomes to come up with you. Okay? Uh, and I know Ricky's a doctor, so he probably knows this bend you into biochemistry, so you will know this base pairs. So you got, you got adenine, guanine, thymine, and cytosin, and AGTC. Those are the codes, right? And, and you, 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 you go to various, you have various combinations of this. You can come up with a particular cell structure, okay? In fact, before we go to the next part, they're, they're saying that somehow in, in, in the near, in the two, three years time, it will revolutionize medicine the way we do it in America because you will do it from a genetic level. You want to battle cancer? You don't drink pharmaceuticals. You program and edit the DNA, introduce that cell into the body, and that cell will call the cancer cell to kill itself because you're, you're structuring 
this AD, AGTC, okay? These are the base pairs that, that you see the ATCG. Now, if you look at the computers, you, you use your cell phone. The cell phone is only possible because of computer programming. And computer programming, whether it's mainframe, PCs, or, or, or mobile devices, is based on what we call binary sequencing. It's just a matter of zero and one. They combine the zero and ones, and then they come, come up with the code, and you come up with the program. You got all of this technology with us. It's zero and one binary. So here's an example. I just put my name there so you can figure it out. Uh, by combining 0, 0, 001 to 0, 01, 0, 0, 1, 1, 1, you have 0, 1 to F. This is a hexadecimal translation, all right? And then by doing this, you basically, you know, you combine this C2, C9, D5, C7, that translates to an alphabetical letter, okay? All I'm trying to say is with a combination of 0, 1, 0, 1, you can have four digits, and you can combine this to limitless possibilities so that you come up with a computer program. You do the same thing with DNA. If you base pair this AGTC, you combine this, you will come up with a genetic code. Um, I forgot the term, but Donna keep, keeps on telling me about that they, they introduce a virus in a gene and they split the gene. I forgot the term that uh, Francis Collin used. But the basic, by basic issue is you gotta find an editor of the DNA. If you can't get to find an editor, you can combine this com you know, all these combinations and come up with the DNA structure of your own. There's a lot of moral implications here. Why? Because you can have genetic engineering, right? You keep <laughs> how do you have a kid? You know, you have a special I want my kid to be blonde, it's gotta be six feet and this, and then you edit that code. So if, if you don't control this, it has staggering implications. In the same token, you can attack, you know, uh, muscular dystrophy, you can attack cancer, you can attack things that we, even Alzheimer's, by just restructuring the DNA code, all right? So whether you have 0001 in computers, now you got all these ADTC combinations, you come up with this. For you form my inward parts, you knitted me in my mother's womb. I praise you, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Why did I say that? Uh, by the way, this is my youngest grandkid, my youngest granddaughter. Her name is, uh, what's her name? Uh, she, um, she even, she, she's so cute, I forgot her name. <laughs> uh, Hope, uh, my, my older, older guy is Lily Hope, and she's uh, Rosie, Rosalie Joy, okay? And I show this when I do an evangelistic presentation. You know, you see the vastness of the universe, you see the DNA on all those universe. As insignificantly small as we are compared to the universe, it's more incredible that we are marked with majesty, for we have been made in the image of God. The small baby that you saw during the dedication today, my grandkid, the baby that's born, that's made in the image of God. And God, God so fit, God so it fit that despite the fact that there's so much complexity within the DNA structure, within the cells of our body, and complexity in the universe, to crown men with the highest of his creation. Only man was created in the image of God. Don't, don't forget that. Not even angels were created in the image of God. Only man was created in the image of God. Okay? So you wonder why a lot of millennials today, you know, the, 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 the expression, are you ready to say, I do, right? You know what that means, right? You get ready to say, married. No, millennials don't say that. I'm ready to say, I don't. Why do they say, I don't? They're so scared of getting married because the world is so unpredictable. What, I'll just have a messy home. I don't, I'd much rather have, they hate marriage, I mean, a lot of this, you know, and there's late adulthood and all sorts of problems right now. So, so the question, why in the world do we have to study parenting? If in fact this current generation are, you know, are, they're allergic towards family and stuff, because parenting is biblical. Parenting was given by the scriptures. And there are, there are two chapters, very small chapters in the Bible I'd like us to go through. Psalm 127 to 128, okay? Um, who's the son of David? Who 
who succeeded David and his son Solomon, all right? Solomon is considered the wisest king who ever lived, uh, not only in Israel. But, so if you get the whole book of Psalms, all 150 chapters, who wrote the book of Psalms? David did, okay? David did. But if you splice the book of Psalms and you begin with Psalm 127 all the way to 128, let somebody read the Psalm 127, verse 1, if you have it. Well, you can, somebody can just read the, the, the screen. Except the Lord build the house, they that labor in vain that build it. Except the Lord keep the city, the watchman wake it, but in vain. All right, I, I don't know exactly what, uh, what version you have, but some, so King James, other versions will tell you that this particular psalm was written by Solomon. It wasn't written by David. This is what they call an ascent psalm or ascent hymn. What's the meaning of ascent psalm? While the people are ascending towards the temple, while they're going to the temple, they sing the songs, right? And so, one, at least Vernon McGee was saying, if you get the psalms written by David, take 127, 128, you got the wisdom of Solomon in 127 and 128, because it was Solomon who wrote this, all right? How does it begin? Unless the Lord builds the house, those who build it labor in vain. Unless the Lord watches over the city, the watchman stays awake in vain. Remember, what was the most famous structure that Solomon built? Temple. The house of the Lord. That's why this is very relevant to what Solomon is saying. Unless the Lord builds the house. And there's nothing more important, okay, than the house of God, which is the temple, which he built. And he himself said, unless it is the Lord who builds it, you labor in vain. Why did Solomon build the temple? Why did David not build the temple? You guys know the story. Because the bloody hands, you are not worthy to build the temple. So he, he placed it on his son to do it. So uh, let's just watch it. You gotta, you'll see the connection to home building in a little while. It is vain that you rise up early and go late to rest, eating the bread of anxious toil, for he gives to his beloved sleep. <laughs> you got you to gotta follow, okay? Basically, he's saying, unless you build the house, what? You will labor in vain because it will be useless, okay? In fact, it is in vain that you rise up early and go to rest, eating the bread of anxious toil. So while this guy is working, he's very, there's anxiety. Plaguing him, there's an, you're becoming anxious. Remember what, what was, what was, what did Jesus say about anxiety? Do not worry, right? Because God takes care of the birds and the lilies of the field. If God, God takes care of the birds and the flowers, you're more important than birds and flowers. So don't worry. But this guy, Solomon, is saying he's so worried. He's working, and he said it doesn't matter how hard you work. If God is not with you in your work, it will be in vain. That's why the first part of our study, if I may go back. It's building a house on vanity. You can build a house and not have a home. If you can build a house, you can have a project, it will be vain. What proves that? This is very important and it's very sad. God said to Solomon, but if you turn aside from following me and serve other gods and worship them, then I will cut off Israel from the land that I have given them and the house that I have consecrated for my name I will cast out of my sight. Whoa, the wonder of the world in the temple of Solomon. You know, you know how much gold there was in the temple of Solomon? We'll read that in a little while. God said, it doesn't matter how grand the structure is. If you turn aside from me and serve other gods, if you go into idolatry, what will happen to you, the building that you built? Yeah, Israel will be cut off this part of the, the people then. I will cast out of my sight the same house you built for me. Even that house will be cast out of my sight. Did that happen? Yeah. 
You know, in the Babylonian captivity, yes, they were, they were pummeled to the ground. They ransacked the temple, the Babylonians did. We studied this when we were studying Revelation, you know, in the covering, covering Daniel, all right? So, uh, so how does this relate to home building? It doesn't matter how good of a psychologist you are and how good of a marriage counselor you are. If you start a family not according to God's will, you will build in vain. That's what it's trying to say, okay? And I got to tell you, uh, although we'll be reading verses here, I borrowed a lot of this com concept from Emerson Eggerich, who talked about love and respect. Have you guys heard of love and respect? Love and respect is the most revolutionary versed in the New Testament that Paul wrote when it comes to marriage and the family. What does it say? Ephesians 5.33 However, let each one of you love his wife as himself and let the wife see that she respects her husband. What, what are the two verbs here? What's the work of the husband? The husband needs to love. What's the work of the wife? The wife needs to respect. You know, uh, Dr. Emerson Eggerich was pastoring a church in Michigan. He studied the Bible 30 hours a week for, for 20 years to preach to his congregation. And then he saw his congregation dropping like, like flies in divorce every year. So said, I, I feel like a failure that I'm not doing anything to help my families to be solid in the church. So he started reading the Bible and then he happened upon this text. So he did his PhD in... in, in, in uh, fatherly counseling, and there was a research in Washington University, and they found out that the, the biggest need of men is respect, and the biggest need of a woman is love, okay? So they tried to verify this, this research. There's another lady I really appreciate a lot. Her name is Shanti Feldan. She, she's a, a Christian counselor and researcher, Harvard graduate, but she was just very, you know what, what they found out? Uh, love and respect is the key to a happy home. So they, they conducted the surveys, uh, Dr. Elgerich said, and asked about, about, about 7,000 couples. He said, if there's, if there's a conflict in marriage, they ask, okay, how does the husband feel? You know that almost 80% of the husband says, when there, ever there's a conflict in marriage, I feel deeply disrespected. That's what he said. They asked the same question of the wife. The wife's answer is different. What was the answer of the wife? I feel deeply unloved. Well, because we got blue and pink. We think differently, like how did that the example? When, when, uh, when the wife says, I have no clothes to wear, you know what that means? I don't have new clothes to wear. Okay, when the guy says I have no 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 clothes to wear, I mean I have nothing clean to wear. Right? So big difference. So uh, and then when when the husband and the wife starts going at it together, you know what happens? You know, 99 beats per second. You know, per per minute. The husband, you know, starts. You go into a warrior mode. What's the warrior mode? The warrior mode means the man goes into a mode where he's willing to die for something he believes in, and he's willing to die for his wife. But the most honorable thing to do is because you know, like, flight or fight, right? So you're about to fight, and the most honorable thing for a man to do is to step back, control yourself. You know. Calm down. Don't say anything. There's a problem when you're in a marriage like that. There's a very big conflict. And the, the husband says, I want to be in my most honorable mode, posture. So I will just back off. I will keep silent. The wife doesn't like that. Because how does the wife handle conflict? They want to process the conflict. They start talking and talking and talking and talking. Meanwhile, the husband doesn't want to talk. And the wife says, I feel deeply in love. And then the longer the wife talks and nags, the husband says, I feel deeply disrespected. Both of them mean well. The husband supposed to step back and try to figure out how to resolve the conflict. Meanwhile, the wife talks and talks so that she can process the conflict. What is the woman trying to do? She's trying to approach the husband so they can be closer. Meanwhile, the husband is getting quiet so they can be closer. Are you getting the difference of the perspective? So even if they don't mean 
you know, they do not mean hate. To go against each other, they misunderstand each other. Oh my, that's why the book of Dr. Emerson Eggridge became a bestseller. He saved so many marriages by just saying, you know, it's amazing. He said, the University of Washington did this research, but I found out 2,000 years ago, God already gave the principle. <laughs> they did not have to spend all that money for the research because it's right there in the Bible, Ephesians 5.33. Wives should not attempt to love their husband more because that's not what the husband is looking for. The husband is looking for respect. Same token, husbands should start loving the wife, not respecting your wife. So when the, when the wife tells the husband, but I've been trying to love you all my life, we've been loving you, that doesn't ring a bell to the husband. And then when the husband tells the wife, I've been respecting you, that doesn't ring a bell to the wife, okay? So what happens? Here's what they call the crazy cycle. Without love, how does the wife react? She reacts without respect. And without respect, how does he react? He reacts without love. So that becomes a crazy cycle. The more he reacts without love, the more she, she, he, she disrespects him, and the more she doesn't love him. It goes on and on and on and on and on. And then when all hell breaks loose, file for a divorce. Marriage is gone. Why? Simple, says Dr. Emerson Eggridge. I don't want to read a lot of texts from you. I want to read a lot of psychology, psychology books. You violate the deficiency 533. All the deficiency 533 is saying, you learn to respect your husband if you're a wife. You husband learn to love your wife if you're the man of the family. So instead of going into the crazy cycle, his advice is have an energizing cycle. What is the energizing cycle? Feel the love tank of your wife. And the more you love her, the more she's motivated to respect you. And the more she respects you, the more you will love her. You're just reversing the process. And you're being very faithful to the plan of God. Why, they, why did they say this? Why, why is it based on one? Unless the Lord builds the house. This is the way you build a home. And if you get married even before children, and you don't build your house the way love and respect has been specified in the Bible, you're spelling trouble in your family life. You've got to start with this. Okay, uh, how do you, I gotta go through this real fast because the second part is parenting. Uh, there's an acronym that Dr. Emerson Hagerich gave so that we can know the language of love and the language of respect. Okay, in terms of the husband, how do you spell love to your wife? It's couple. What's the meaning of couple? Closeness, number one. She wants you to be close and not just when you want the physical intimacy, okay? Um, how does she go? Sometimes all it takes is for you to reach out and take her hand while you're going in the car, okay? Uh, her, here's this one wife and say, oh my, my husband buys me everything, you know? And he, she, she, he gives me everything, you know? And we go on vacations, we go on this thing and then, but she is crying. But he never puts his arm around me when we are in church. He never expresses the love, you know, closeness. What else? Openness. She wants you to open up to her, to talk and not be close up or act angry or disinterested. You know that the man's brain is different from a woman's brain? You know the difference? The difference between a woman's, uh, the woman's brain and a man's, man's brain is very focused. If you, if you can imagine a computer, you only have one window for a man, okay? In order to process another window, you gotta close the window and open up another window. Now, if you go to a woman's brain, how does a woman's brain operate? You got multiple windows. And sometimes, when you close the window, there's another window that pops up. Have you been hit by spamware? You know, all over the place. That's the way a woman thinks. Because a woman can handle all of this. Women, men, do not handle it that way. And if something is not resolved, it's okay for us to just sit down. Wife goes, hey, where'd you go today? Oh, I went fishing with my buddies all day. What'd you talk about? <laughs> the husband goes, nothing. <laughs> he can't, how can you be fishing all day and talk about nothing? Yes, because we are men. We don't have to talk. <laughs> we just do something. That's why they call shoulder to shoulder, side by side. Women, on the other hand, give them 30 minutes. They got a lot of stories. But that's the way their brain operates. 
That's why I remember this, the uh, Mark Gunger, Pastor Mark Gunger, gave this illustration and just uh, said that the woman has what thirty thousand words in her vocabulary. Man has fifteen thousand words. So man works all day. He comes home. He already exhausted fourteen thousand nine hundred ninety words in the office. So he's got ten words left. Meanwhile, the wife only exhausted fifteen thousand. She's got fifteen thousand more words left. So he goes into the door and tells, "Honey, what's for dinner?" What's for dinner? That's three words, okay? And then after a while, he has nothing else to say, but the wife still wants to talk, okay? So one thing you gotta, you gotta learn, they said that you women, you wives, sometimes, you know, when the husband tells you, hey, honey, uh, you wanna watch TV with me? Yeah, you sit down together in the couch. The husband doesn't mean, hey, you watch, we watch TV and we'll talk to each other. No, you just sit and you watch. Because that's the way a man's... Meanwhile, the woman wants to talk. But that's the way God made us. So he's saying, because you know that your wife is like that, find ways to accommodate. You know, even if you only have 10 words left at the end of the day, try to talk to her in, in order to express that love. Because the more you do that, the more love she'll feel. You must have understanding. There's another problem with the man's brain. You give him a problem... The first inclination of a man is to fix it, right? You have a problem, fix it. That's the, man, the way men talks, you know? Let's fix the car, it's broken, okay? How about the woman? No, they do not fix it. They talk about the problem, right? <laughs> and, they, and, and that's, so don't try to fix her, just listen and be. So sometimes men needs to just sit down and listen to the wife. Let her vent if you need to, okay? Uh, and then peacemaking. Oh, the, the power of I'm sorry. You know, remember, um, why, why is it so difficult for men to reach the destination if you haven't been there before? Number one, because he doesn't have a GPS, okay? And because he doesn't have a GPS, what does he need to do? He needs to ask questions. But do we stop for directions as men? No. If you are a normal human, human male, you will not stop for directions. You want to do it by yourself. Just like my kid, when Justin was still growing up, we drove around for a lot of, of uh, speaking appointments. And then one day, uh, we haven't reached our destination. And then he didn't get, was getting worried. Hey, we got to be there at such and such a time. And then Justin said, don't worry, Mom. Hey, we may, we may get lost, but, God, but, but, but Dad will take us there. <laughs> He'll get lost, we'll still take us there. Why? Because our tendency is to fix. And we don't say, do I need this? Do I say... I'm sorry, make a boo-boo. You know how, how loving it is for a wife to hear from you? I made a boo-boo, I made, I made the mistake, I'm sorry, okay? And then loyalty, always assure of your love and commitment. Uh, they, they surveyed a ton of women, a ton of wives, and they said, what is your primary need if you were to tell something? And you know what the wife said? I'd like to be sure that she, he will choose me all over again. That's what he's saying, all right? And then esteem, your wife wants you to honor and cherish her. That's why a simple, simple gift of flowers, yeah, rose, you got rose, and uh, some gifts. It doesn't have to be expensive. Uh, Dr. Gary Chapman, when I talked to you about five love languages, said one day he had no money, but he wanted to give his wife a rose, so he, he conducted the funeral sermon. During the reception, there were a bunch of roses on the table. So he asked the family, can I have some rose I got to take to my wife? And the family goes, oh, Dr. Chapman, you can get the entire vase. So he gets the entire vase, a couple dozen roses, takes it to her wife, and the wife loved it. The wife even knew it came from the funeral. She still loved it. The bottom line is, Esteem, if you tell her you're valuable and I cherish you, you know, you're not buying it for the sake of the money, you're just remembering. So, I'll, you can download this when, when we upload, but couple is the way husbands should do it. Okay, now for women, they must show their respect. And the six, six biblical ways in which this can happen is the acronym CHAIRS, okay? CHAIRS says CONQUEST. Recognize and thank him for his desire to work. You know, he goes, try to earn the bread that the family needs. Hardly say anything, thank you. 
Dr. Ch uh, Dr. Emerson Egrich said, you know, why don't you have made this experiment? One day when your husband comes to comes home, you tell your husband, you know, honey, I haven't said this, but I really appreciate and respect what you do for your family. It's amazing how much you contribute to the family and that you, you, you're sure that our needs are met. And then you just walk out, walk away. You know what's going to happen? I ask my, whoops, where did I where it come from? Hey, 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 come, come back here, let's talk. Because they hardly hear this. They need assurance that they have achieved. Why? Because when men congregate together, what do they normally talk about? Tell me. They talk about work, what else? Sports. Sports. It's achievement. Achieve, that's the man's mind. So since that's the way God made him, got to make sure you give him affirmation in terms of his achievement. Okay, that's the way you respect him. And then hierarchy, thank him for his motivation to protect and provide for you. Um, Dr. Emerson Egerich influenced a couple, and one of this couple is a pastor. Wife says, honey, I have to go to the mall tonight because I need to buy something. And then the pastor said, not, not tonight, over my dead body because just the previous week there was a rape in the mall. Because there was a rape in the mall and she wants to go by herself because the pastor was tied up. She said, you're not going by yourself. You know, you, you cannot go to this door unless you go over my dead body. What was he trying to say? I am here to protect you. Okay. I'm not here to give you a hard time. I am concerned about you. I care about you. That's why you got to be sensitive to that as a woman. Okay, recognize that he wants to protect you. And then authority, acknowledge his desire to lead and don't subvert his leadership. I always said this example. First year I came to America, we had to travel to California. Once we got to San Jose, you know, and in San Francisco, we stayed in an apartment. It was a two bedroom apartment. A couple was living in an apartment with three kids. What they ended up doing was they gave us one of the rooms and they slept in the family room. You know, Filipino hospitality, that's the way you do it. You know what's fascinating? The lady of the house was a medical director of one of her biggest hospitals in the Philippines. She was a surgeon. She had a very big house in the Philippines. All her kids had a car when they went to college. That's how rich they were. The husband was a simple accountant. Of course, that's a simple accountant compared to a doctor as a surgeon. After a while, the husband said, I can't do this. I'm supposed to be the provider of the family and you're forking out everything so our family can eat, kids can go to school. I gotta go. I go to the States. I'll move, migrate to the States and maybe build a career there. You know what they did? The whole family decided to go with their dad. So she left the hospital, she left her practice, and moved to San Francisco. That's where we met them. I didn't know the story until my friend told me about the story. And I was talking to the lady, I said, uh, uh, oh, how's it going? Are you taking the medical boards here in the States so you can practice surgery? And um, I'm too old for that. I'll just be a physician assistant, and I'm okay. And you know what you told me? We've never been so happy as a family. I'm not saying this should happen to all the families, but you know what she did? She acknowledged the desire of the husband to fend for the family. I mean, not everybody needs to go to that extent. But you know how, how, how loud that language is respect will ring in the ears of the husband when he does that? Simple, authority. Insight. Listen appreciative, appreciatively to his ideas and to the advice he wishes to offer. That's what the, the, the man does. So, so you know what wives can do? Wives can still decide, but they can make it appear that it was the man who decided. You know what I'm trying to say? I mean, if the man doesn't know how to do it, you don't tell your husband, why did I marry an idiot? You don't say that. You find a way, you turn around, make a good decision for the family, and make it appear that the husband made the decision. How do you do that? Let me give you a, let me give you a clue. Just say you're discussing things, and during the discussion, come up with a solution, and then make your husband feel that she was, he was part of the discussion. And when the solution comes up, Honey, I really like you, you know, the way you lead this family. You can implement this decision. 
You know how, how much that will spell respect to your husband? And when you do that, how much he will love you back? That's what it did. It's a very practical thing, okay? Relationship, value his desire for you to be his friend and stand shoulder to shoulder with him. Remember, sometimes he doesn't need to talk. Just sit down by Example that Dr. Dr. Egrich was saying, especially, we'll cover this a little bit, especially for boys, you know, are growing up in high school. You know what the mother needs to do is not to nag the boys. What the mother needs to do is go out there, watch them play ball, and just sit down and watch the kids. I'll spend a couple hours. After spending, don't say anything. Just drive them, go back home. By the time they get home, just say, Hey guys, can you like, uh, take out the garbage and clean your rooms? They will clean their rooms and they will take out the garbage because you were there with them respecting what they were doing in the sports. You know? Those are simple things. I'm not saying it's going to happen all the time, but that, that, the language of respect. And of course, sexuality. You got to make sure that the physical needs of the husband is met. So if you were to summarize this, this is the foundation of a home. The foundation of a man and a wife, you need couple. Okay, from, for the woman, if you want to express love, and for the man, if you want to express respect, you need chairs. Okay, takes us to the second part. The second part, whereas the first part says building a house on vanity, we will go to building a home on values. Now, what, what, what's, the, what's the lesson in Psalms? Basically, Psalms is saying, you can try to have a home, but if you do not follow the love and respect principle of the Bible, and you don't love and respect each other, from your end, the house will not stay. That's what, so this is the second part. There's only two parts to our study. When you build a house, not based on God's principle, it will not last, but you can build a home on values. Whereas you're building a house on vanity, because you just follow your own way, you can build a home on values. Okay, so we go to verse 3 of Psalm 127. Behold, children are heritage from the Lord, the fruit of the womb a reward, right? Like arrows in the hand of a warrior are the children of one's youth. Blessed is the man who fills his quiver with them. Uh, what did God say about children? They are what? what? What's a heritage? Heritage is an inheritance, right? They're saying, I mean, like me, I'm really getting old. I don't know. They're saying I'm about to collect my Social Security <laughs> about a year. And they're saying, oh, you, you better be glad. If you reach the age of 65, according to statistics, you might live to be 90 years old. That's what they're saying. If you make it to 65. So I... If I make it this year, I have a lot more years left, okay? But you're, you're getting old. So my, what your question now in your head is, oh, what will happen when I die, right? You got to think of your kids. You got to think of your grandkids. That's a heritage, okay? And if you got children, uh, I'm, I'm visiting a friend of ours in church. I wish I had more children because I had, if I had more children, more of them will take care of me now in my old age. Okay, but that's that's why children are heritage from the Lord. Well, how what's the word picture you use here? They're like arrows. What do you use arrows for? Well, that's, they didn't have guns then. Arrows was a weapon of war. And you may be a very good marksman if you don't have arrows in your quiver. You'll be useless. So it would be nice to have your quiver full. So basically, he's saying. This is for security, and this is for prowess. That's, that's a word picture. The more kids you have, the more security you'll have, okay? And then he goes, blessed is everyone who fears the Lord, who walks in his ways. You shall eat of the fruit of the labor of your hands. You shall be blessed, and it shall be well with you. So, okay, we said, if you want to start a home on values, make sure that you have kids. Okay, fill your home with kids. Have a big family. Yeah, that's, that's the counsel. But make sure that while you're building your family, you fear the Lord. Because by fearing the Lord, you will be blessed. How will you be blessed? Let's look at the next two verses. Your wife will be like a fruitful vine within your house. Your children will be like olive shoots around your table. Behold, thus shall the man be blessed who fears the Lord. What does it say? 
You fear the Lord. What's the meaning of fearing the Lord? If you go back to 127, verse, I think it's verse 1 and 2, you follow his ways. Fearing the Lord is not being scared of God. Fearing the Lord means obeying him. Okay? When you fear the Lord, you obey him. You go with this way. And if you follow the principles, you're faithful to what God tells you, you know what happens, you will be blessed. The blessing will take the form of a wife who is fruitful, not only in terms of children, but fruitful in terms of the way she handles the family, fruitful in terms of giving you joy and happiness in the family, and your children will be like olive shoots, all right? There are two word pictures here, the vine and the olive. What do you get from the vine? Wine, wine okay? Grape juice. Uh, what do you get, get from the olives? Olive oil. Olive oil. All right, so, so olive, the vine, and the olive is not like grain, okay? Grain you need every day to survive, right? Uh, wine is only for, according to the Jewish rabbi, without wine there will be no joy in a celebration, in a party. So you need wine for celebration. And you need olive shoots, the oil, for special food. So what Solomon is saying, if you learn to fear the Lord, your home will have something special. You will have wine and you will have olives. Okay? I got to mention this already, but might as well say this. Uh, the lineal says, I don't want to get married anymore, instead of saying I do. I, I didn't want to believe this until, yes, Ricky. How about the wine being like the word of God, like a doctrine, like the word, and mm. uh, uh, oil being like the Holy Spirit? Sure, you can, you can look at it that way too. It, of course, that's another word picture in the New Testament. In this particular case, though, it is said in the context of a family, of a wife and children. Right? But that, that doesn't preclude the fact that the wine can be the word and the oil can be the Holy Spirit. But in this particular context in Psalms, it talks about the wife being making the family special because she can produce kids, she can produce happy, you know, having the mom at home. Uh, and then... Uh, of, of course, the olive it gives you oil, the special oil. And the wife being the church. Yes, the wife being, right. that, that, that's, that, that's, that's still part of it, right? But uh, I, didn't be, I didn't want to believe this until I met a friend. There's a very good singer from, from Toronto. When I saw him, uh, very close to his parents, parents told me, you know, Bing, the name was Boyet, you know, and that's not a cameraman. Boy, it doesn't want to get married. What do you mean he doesn't want to get married? Man, he's an eligible bachelor. Uh, because he saw a bunch of his friends just go through divorce. Might as well not get married. Uh, is that, the, is that the, the sign of God? We already talked about that. The, the sign of God is for people, if possible, to be reproductive. Okay? So, we go to parenting now. <coughs> So Dr. Agarich grabbed this principle of love and respect between a husband and a wife, and he said, oh, I didn't realize that. When I read the Bible, I saw that the same relationship between parents and kids is driven by love and respect from the Bible, okay? Let's look at Bible verses here. So there's, there's a crazy cycle also in love and respect, because the Bible says the kid should what? Their parents, what does the Ten Commandments say? Honor. honor. What's another word for honor? Respect, right? So let's go to some verses. Exodus 20, 12. Honor your father and your mother, that your days may be long in the land that the Lord your God is giving you. All right? So if the children dishonor the father and mother, the parents can kill the kids. That's in the Bible. Give me this. That's what Jesus said. Yeah, in the book of Jesus. Yeah, Jesus is called in Deuteronomy here. For God commanded, honor your father and your mother, and whoever reviles father and mother must surely die. Uh, within, the, within the Jewish economy, okay, again, this is, we're no longer in the Jewish economy. It was, a, it was a theocracy with God leading out. One of the capital punishments that you can commit, when I say capital crimes that you can commit, is dishonoring your parents. You can die. Okay. Oh, okay, that's good. That's a good question. Dr. Emerson Rager says this. These are normal conditions. Now, if there's no evil where the father abuses both wife and kids, 
you got to get out of the house because it's a known evil. This is for normal counseling, all right? There are extraordinary circumstances that, you, that will cause you to react differently from the general counsel. These are general principles to follow. And then Paul, you just talk, you, Moses said it when God said it in Exodus 20. He goes to, to Matthew 15, Jesus said it. Then Paul says this in Ephesians 6, Children, what? Obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. Meanwhile, fathers, do not provoke your children to anger. Bring them up in discipline and instruction of the Lord. You go and extend this to verses 20. Honor your father and mother, says Paul. This is the first commandment with a promise, that it may go well with you and that you may live long in the land. And like Benji's question, even if you are not subjected to judgment because you dishonored your parents, it has always been the rule if you observe children who dishonor their parents eventually just do damage to themselves. What is the promise? Honor your father and your mother that thy days may be long on the land which the Lord gave. What does that mean? If you go, if you violate that, what will happen to your days? We'll shorten your days, all right? Parents can kill you. Yeah, but again, the, the principle that God gave does not necessarily mean an explicit judgment from the community. The principle that God gave is, if you do not honor your parents, you will basically destroy yourself. Example. Was it one who brought it up? Um, we will go to the Philippines next month because I'll be marrying a couple. By the way, pray for us. The, the man is the the son of the special counsel of the president of Rwanda. Uh, she's, she's Adventist, but she's very intelligent. Uh, but with that trip, my friend is kind, was kind enough to take us to Japan. So we'll be in Japan for about a week. You know the difference between Japanese culture and American culture? I don't know if you watch this. You know how they educate the kids in Japan? It took them less than six months after the tsunami. Remember the tsunami in Japan? that move Alaska so many miles closer to North America, to Japan. You know why? <coughs> Took them six months. You can live a bag, okay? In the north side of Japan, where the tsunami went, when the nuclear plant exploded, leave it for three months, you go back, the bag will still be there. The honesty of the Japanese people is amazing. You cross the road, whether you're an old folk or a child, and the driver gives you the right of way, you know what the Japanese will do? They'll bow. They'll bow. So my friend said, you look, look at Japan. I mean, during the Japanese war, the Philippines was up there. The Philippines could have been a better nation. Vietnam is even better than the Philippines today. They were devastated by the Vietnam War. What happened? He said, look at Japan. Japan is like a superpower, you know. You know what they found out? In Japan, the first three years of school for kids, they learn nothing more than GMRC. You know what GMRC is, right? Good manners and right conduct. They had to inculcate in the minds of the kids how to respect the elders, how to be courteous, all the ethical rules of culture. And then, so you can see a little kid in Japan can go to school about seven, eight years old by himself or by herself and not fear about anything because that's the way the Japanese culture was. So what my friend did was they talked to the Ministry of Education in Japan and they got the curriculum. They want to apply that curriculum to Adventist education in the Northern Philippines. Yeah, that's what they're trying to do now. And they're asking one of the Japanese women, will you allow your kid to be educated in the ed American educational system? <laughs> the, the, the woman just burst, the Japanese woman burst out laughing. No, I will not allow my kid to be there. What am I trying to say? In America today, you talk to anybody now on the street, they can badmouth the president. Right? Because for America, who is number one? Number one is me. I don't care if you're my parent, I don't care if you're my president, you're my governor, my mayor. I have the right to go against you because the most important person in this country is me. What happened to America? You know how, how messed up our values are now? Uh, they're up for debate now because they want to add another gender to applications. 
not just male or female. Okay. Yes, uh, Juan. You know, uh, I grew up in, in a broken home, but as I study the Word of God, and you know, I hear this still small voice. You know, uh, I learned that a, a, a house before it comes becomes a home. Uh, it must be started on the right perspective. Mm -hmm. You know, um, children, uh, when the house is, is started the right way, according to the Word of God and His Word, as said in the right perspective, children are uh, end up becoming assets and gifts from God, not liabilities. Yeah. You know, and I never had uh, the opportunity to live with a, 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 a family like that, but or even have a family in a home. But then I, I searched the word of God, and God says, uh, when your family has abandoned you, then I will become mm. your father and your mother. Yeah. So I mean, you, you're blessed in so many ways, but there's so many kids today Young people, as you're talking about, uh, who, who are afraid to say yes, or the millennials, and you know, uh, again, how would they know if somebody don't go tell them? Sure. And, and, and in closing, you know, uh, there's going to come a time when people from other countries are going to have to preach mm -hmm. to us. Yeah. And it's already happening because we've lost our morals. Sure. If you, have, uh, and, you know, I, I appreciate the assignment that the church gave me this year because the church assigned me to teach the high school kids. Um, and people think it's easy to teach the Bible. Try teaching it to high school kids. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm so glad. I've been praying a lot for my class every day. I'm breaking ground and some of the kids are responding now. Because you know what, they, what we've proven? All the research across denominational bodies and churches all over America, not just have this denomination. As soon as these kids graduate from high school, they're gone. Some of them end up not believing in God. Now, puberty comes in there, adulthood and kind of stuff. But the fact is, they were never given seeds. Like you said, they were not trained in the principles of God. So I told the kids, what, a couple of weeks ago when I was teaching the high school kids, you know what, we're sitting here every Sabbath opening the God's Word. I don't want you to just have head knowledge, you know, understand all these doctrines. I can feed you doctrines, explain it to you. The most important thing is for each one of you to have a personal relationship with God. Because you, once you get there, you will know that He's the most important thing. You've got to follow Him and love your Bible and love to pray. And I said, I will not stop doing all I can with the power of the Spirit to be God's instrument for you to understand that before you graduate. Because I don't want you to live the halls of high school and go to college without having a personal relationship with God. Because you're right, Juan, if they don't, the enemy's gonna grab that. But like I said, one of the best ways to do this is to reach them while they're young. In fact, George Barnes' survey said, what's the best time to reach the mind of somebody you want to lead to Jesus Christ? 12, 13, 14 years old, right about the time when they're molding their minds. I'm not saying you're gonna reach people when they're 30 or 40. Yes, there's, there's still time, there's ways to do that, but they're saying if we reach these kids at their, you know, where their mind is very susceptible to the Word of God, the better it would be. In fact, I've been in this church for over 30 years and I've seen generations come and go. You know what I found out, Juan? If you don't get them while they're in high school in their teenage years, you will lose them. And I, I, there are some guys who've stuck around and help out in church. They're all over the country now. One is an elder, the other is a treasurer of a church. But I also see other kids who never committed to Christ. They don't care about God today. They care about the American dream. Okay, not about God, but what happened? They tried to pursue the American dream, and what happened to their American dream? It fell, so they got problems with their families, okay? And that's God's way to call them back, right? And sometimes, sometimes it becomes very painful. God is to break you for you to come back. 
But I, I agree with you, Juan. If we can reach them at an early age and tell them about the love of Jesus, give them these principles, it'll probably make a difference in our society. I mean, that's why you say, if I can only reach even, like, give me, give me about five or six of these high school kids this year before they graduate, if they have a relationship with Jesus Christ. They can be used by God to do powerful things. But you got to get them whenever you can get them. You got to share the word. Unless you share the word, you don't sit there and say, you know, we've been sitting in church and not teaching the kids. And then after they graduate, parents start going, oh, my kid doesn't want to go to church. It's not interested in God. What did you do? Well, they were growing up, right? I mean, it was our own making that made that happen. So we've decided as a church, that's why we're trying to be oriented as a family, to hit them while they're young because... It, it's, it's critical because I had children, mm -hmm. okay? And, and I started at the age of 10 years old mm -hmm. because I wasn't taught about a wife and a husband. Sure. I learned on the streets. Sure. <clears throat> so here we got children. I already had a problem with growing up without being taught appropriately. And now I bring children later on in life into the world and I can't teach them either. And here we go. Yeah, the cycle. And the cycle's coming down. Yeah, sure. Sure. And so generations of people sure. are being destroyed. Sure. And so sure. and so now, like you said, there's a batch of kids out there. There's a batch of teenage kids who grow up. I mean, we know the divorce rate's high. We know some children only have one parent. We know that some don't have any. Mm -hmm. But if they're taught appropriately, yeah. Yeah. imagine when you get to heaven, sure. how many people you will use just because you changed two people sure. from bringing in another sure. group of people sure. who brought in another group sure. and sure. taught the wrong sure. way. Sure. So, this sure, is beautiful, sure, what's sure. being taught here. And, I, I, and, and in fact, we will close our study this afternoon because you can't do anything. What will you do about the kids who are going out there? They'll probably go doing drugs now because they thought the American dream is going to fulfill what they want. Okay? Uh, it's a good, we will end it in a nice way because God still has grace. Okay? But I'm saying, but if you can, just think if they were your own family, you would like to hit them when you can hit them. You know, don't, don't wait for them to waste their lives before they can be taken back, you know. Get them while they're young. And, then, and that's why my friend told me, your first church is your family. Before you even go out, make sure your family knows how to pray, spend time with the Word, and to test out their values. And as little as that, like Kwan is saying, I mean, who knows, your kid might be used by God. I, I, growing up, I prayed a lot for my kid. I never expected my kid to be a pastor. No, he's a pastor. Okay? But I, out of my wildest dream, I thought he's going to be a musician and do something else. But they reach one of those high school, school students, and then high school students will reach the, the sure. rest. I, I'm pretty sure you, you've been reading Moody. You're, you're reading about Moody. You know who took Moody to the Lord, right? A shoe cobbler. A shoe, yeah. 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 And then you know what happened, right? After Moody was taken to the Lord, some guy, what was it, Sanke, Edward Sanke, who attended the meeting, got to know the Lord because of what Moody did. And eventually this guy influenced Billy Graham. Yeah, <laughs> you know, just because of one cobbler. Just one cobbler. That Moody was able to do from the streets of Chicago mm -hmm. went all the way to London to preach out of the tabernacle that Charles Spurgeon had him preached yeah. out. Yeah. Moody went all the way from there. He was converted by a shoemaker mm -hmm. all the way to London preach out of one of the greatest tabernacles. Sure. So, you're, you're, you're right. Uh, the thing is, don't, don't, don't fall into the, the, the trap of the numbers game. And people just say, ah, I gotta reach a lot more people. No, reach the next guy. And then after that, reach an, another guy. And if it doesn't matter, you just reach as much as you can when the Lord opens up the way of it. So this, the second part is they, this, the, this is what the other part of the Bible says. Older women likewise are to be reverent in behavior and Titus. They are to teach what is good and so train young women to love their husbands and their children. Let me just summarize this. The Bible tells you the children should respect their parents. The Bible also tells you that women, mothers or parents should learn to what? To love their children. So what is the principle of love and respect? Children should respect their parents 
and parents should love their children. Are you following? That is God's prescription. You follow that blueprint, you'll be okay. How do you do that? Guides. This is based on what I've already read from you, the text that I gave you. This is a summary of what Dr. Eggert is saying. Give so that the child's basic needs can be met. That's why, but what did I say? Your first church is your family. If people don't give the church, who's going to pay for the electricity? Who's going to pay, who's going to pay for the parking lot and all this stuff? That's why people have got to give. That's part of your family. And as parents, your primary responsibility is to provide for your child's basic physical needs. So you give. You is for understand. Understand your kid. So you, you do not provoke or exasperate the kids. He's Paul. Example. There's this one couple expecting a baby girl. So they dressed up the room. The crib was there. Everything was so nice. Because any time now, the mother is about to deliver the kid. Then the mom goes there one afternoon. She opens the door. And lo and behold, all their brother is there with crayons in his hands. And that room was full of crayons all over the place, including the crib. So if you did not seek to understand your kids, you will just blow up. <laughs> what in the world did you do? I prepared this for your kid. And before she could say anything, she held back herself. And then you know what the little boy said? Mom, mom, I wanted to have the room prepared specially for my coming sister. So I had to call her in. Child didn't know, but the child had a heart for the coming gift of God. And how many times do parents not step back and try to understand their kids? And that becomes a conflict when, in fact, it is so, so, a lot of times the, the heart of a child is so pure. But because you sense a little disrespect, you don't return love and understanding their kid, you mess up the relationship. Number I, letter I, that's what you said. Instruct your child, your child to know God. Teach them how to pray. Teach them to read the Bible. You know, I was just, I was just talking to one of the members today, requesting for prayers. He said, my grandkids know all of these technical terms, but they do not know who Daniel is. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. I mean, fine, you got to learn, teach them reading, writing, arithmetic, and science, but teach them God first. Uh, so one of my favorite pictures in Facebook was when Lily went to Rosie and one day both of them folded their hands together and started praying. Nothing can touch the grandpa's heart more than having two grandkids praying together. That's what you want to do. Instruct them. And then of course D, discipline your child. All the politically correct guys out there that say, don't discipline your kid because you will ru ruin the kid's ego. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Have you heard of Tony? You know Tony Evans, right? Tony Evans is one of the, the dynamic preachers in, in Texas, Dallas, Texas. Tony says, I come home one day. I tell my kid, hey, kiddo, can you take the trash out? And then the kid goes, Dad, I don't feel like taking the trash out. <laughs> and then the Tony Evans says, I can change that feeling right away. <laughs> 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 but you know, but the culture says, oh, my kid doesn't feel like taking out the trash. So you don't have to take out the trash. So one of these days, uh, Dad, Mom, I want to be high. I feel like being high. And uh, oh, my kid feels being high. You see how dumb we've become by society? You follow God's program, you will learn how to discipline in the Lord. Uh, we were here last Sabbath, uh, Lori Aguilera gave her testimony. She said, went to the Christian school, and the Christian son was my classmate. And he, made, he did something wrong that day. So the principal calls him to his office. And you know what I did? Lori said, I went like this, and watch what's going to happen. I saw the principal took her own son, his own son, and laid the son on his lap. And gave that boy two whoopings. After he gave the boy two whoopings, they were hugging each other and they were praying. 
And, and Laurie was saying, I want that. I want that for my kid. When I become a mother, I want that for my kid. Discipline is not lording it over your kid and abusing your kid. Discipline is training them in the way of the Lord. But this is one of the problems in society. You say anybody who wants to discipline their kids are abusing their kids. No, there's a biblical way to discipline. So we much rather say, let's go with the feelings of the kids. That's why the story is, of course, you must learn to encourage the kids so that your child can courageously develop God-given gifts. Learn to encourage your kids. Uh, and then, of course, S is the most important thing. Supplicate is to pray for them. You should pray for your kids. Um, we will be landing now. Uh, do you remember that story you told about understanding? Uh -huh. yeah, the little boy uh, did something yeah. with his father. He had a brand new special sports car. So oh, yeah. I'll, I'll repeat that bit. It was sent to me by a friend. He bought a brand new Porsche. And it's a red Porsche. He was washing the car one day. <laughs> This a green sees his kid on the other side with a stone scratching on the car. So he got the crowbar and started hitting hands of the kid. Didn't realize he was hitting the kid until he broke all the fingers. Took the kid to the hospital. The kid was asking his dad, Dad, will I be able to use my fingers again? Broke the father's heart. And you know what really hurt him? He went back to his driveway. He looked at his car. You know what was etched on the car? I love you, Dad. I don't know how true the story was, but supposedly that dad couldn't take it. He killed himself. Uh, but uh, that may be an extreme example, but there are, the Bible says, before you lash out at your kid, you understand your kid. Don't exasperate your kid. Encourage your kid. That's what Paul is saying. You know, that, that, what's the creation cycle? The more the kids disrespect you, the more unloving you become as a parent, right? And the more unloving you become, the more they rebel. That becomes a crazy cycle. What is the energy, energizing cycle? Show your kid how much you love them. And the more you love them, they will learn to respect you. Okay. One caveat before we go. Because uh, Moody, Moody, Bible, Moody Radio interviewed Dr. Emerson Egerich. And the interview and was, was Nancy, I forgot his last name. Maybe you can remember. One of the, Nancy, somebody. And he said, oh, I'm talking about another book. You remember Five Love Languages by doc, Dr. Gary Chapman? And then, oh, and then Dr. Emerson Egerich, I, yeah, I know Gary. We talk a lot. But you remember, based on what we studied, love comes at a man differently as to a woman, right? Because the woman is more from her, we talked about that. It's couple, it's not chairs. So I tend to agree with the principles of Ephesians 5.33. So what happens the moment your kid goes into the teenage years? They, become, they, they start maturing, right? And you know what? The boy will crave for respect and the girl, girl will crave for love. How do you do this? A very good example. And this probably benefits you. There's a lot more. I invite you to just grab a hold of uh, Emerson Agrich's books, uh, Love and Respect in the Family. But here's an example. Uh, boy was asked by the mom, hey, I you clean up your room? <laughs> it's been days. He didn't do anything in his room. So what do you do? Do you nag the boy? No, here's what the way you do it. If you are the mother, you go to your boy, who's a teenager. He said, you know what? I'm not dissing you. I'm your mom. I respect you. You're a man. You're a man of your word, okay? But you've promised me to clean up your room. You haven't cleaned up your room. Help me out here. How can I tell you this without disrespecting you? You are, you are a man. To, true to your word, you know, you can do this. Instead of saying, it's been three days. You haven't cleaned your room. See the difference? If it's a boy, show your respect for the boy, and he will resonate with what you say. If it's a girl, show your love to the girl, and the teenage girl will resonate with you. It's very simple. And you know what? I mean, you know how many lives this book has changed? 
in fact, one of the lives that was changed by this book was the own daughter of Dr. Emerson Egerich. She was a feminist. <laughs> she said, when my, my, when my dad wrote this book, you, you got to love your wife unconditionally. Amen, amen, amen. Love your wife unconditionally. And then the other part, you should respect your husband unconditionally. Whoa, 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 dad. Whoa, 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 hold on. R respect is earned, right? You heard that. Now you read the Bible, no, respect is not earned. You're a kid, you got a dad and your mom. You respect your mom and your dad. It's almost like going to God. Hey, you must earn your worship. God doesn't earn his worship. He is worthy of worship. Parents are worthy of honor and respect. That's the bl blueprint of the scriptures. So Joy finally had to go through all her own turmoil. She sees husbands and wives attending the seminars of his dad. Oh, yeah, yeah, that happened to us. You see, lives change. But she never believed her dad until she had her own problems with her relationships. And in the end, when God broke her, she finally realized that her dad was right. She started practicing love and respect in her own life. Now she's got her own ministry. It's an amazing story. I said, I have no time to treat. But here, here's the bottom line. Yes, yes. Uh, well, if you have a mind, you know, from mm -hmm. zero to four, according to psychologists and mm -hmm. neurologists, the neuron forms dendrites, and each mm -hmm. dendrite is an experience mm -hmm. form. Okay? Now, that experience, if it is not repeated, the dendrite is not thick. Sure. It withers away. Mm -hmm. So if the positive reinforcement is done, mm -hmm. frequently that dendrite is very strong, mm -hmm. it will carry on into adulthood. And sure. it is easy for the child mm -hmm. to receive instructions mm -hmm. because he already knows. And sure, there's already a path. path. There's a path. Yeah, there's, there's, a, there's a path. So now, if there is no dendrite uh, form because sure. the experience from the parent mm -hmm. is negative, the neurons doesn't have enough uh, dendrites, then that child sure. should die early sure. because the less dendrites you have, the sure. more you have Alzheimer's. So you got, so, sure, so you got, you got your brain science behind that, but basically, let me translate that into culture. You know, I'm not so, a lot of parents cry to me, you know, what's going on in church, I mean, I, I, guess I was with my kid growing up, took the kids to church almost every weekend here, and now my kid doesn't even have the time for God. Said, yeah, and they start crying. Um, I pray for those guys too, and every so often I get a phone call. I'm not so worried about them because God's going to pursue them. <laughs> and I don't know how God's going to reach them. They'll come back. You know what I'm worried about? Our kids who have no seeds planted at all. Right? Yes, and when you, one knows this. He said that because, you know, we're talking about the Word of God, and, and, and I'm learning here. I'm learning, you know, uh, because again, I grew up without yeah. a mother and father. My mother was an addict, a heroin addict, and a dealer. She was a drug dealer, and, and so, anyway. What I'm saying is here, we're saying a child is supposed to respect his mother. Well, when I was five years old and I wanted to wear a shirt that she didn't want me to wear, my mother broke my nose. Wow. Okay, that was how the respect I was taught. Wow. So the thing is, you know, I still got my nose broke, but how do I teach my kid how to respect if I was never taught how to respect? Sure. And it goes on and on and on. And it wasn't until I came to the Word of God that I, and, and it's through uh, His faithfulness, because what I learned was, I'm richer than a lot of people would ever be rich because inside of his word are his promises. And I've come to learn that he likes when you put your finger on him and tell him, hey, you said you're gonna do this and I'll do it. So I learned to call him on his promises. And one of them is that I was telling the pastor here earlier, was that he promises to restore the years to you that the locusts have eaten, mm -hmm. so it's mm -hmm. never too late. Mm -hmm. And so now, mm -hmm. There are, are kids out there that I see. Mm -hmm. I see the mothers talking to them like savages and they're this big, this big. They called all kinds of foul names and, and mm -hmm. three, four, five years old. And I, you know, we can pray for them, but then there's some sure. that want to learn how to respect, but sure. they never learn it. Sure. Hey, that, that, that's only interesting with the fact that the more you stray away from God's word, the more messed up your life would be. 
And when you come closer to God's word, you know, and the good, good thing is in two more slides, we will summarize this with grace. And I'd like to end on that note because you got to admit, this is a messed up world. And there's a lot of lives that's already messed up. They're no longer four or five years old. They're no longer teenagers. They're grown up people. For all you care, they got messed up families. Does God care about it? Yes, he does. You know? But if we can avoid going there, that's what this, the lesson is about. As parents, learn to teach them while, while they're young. So you don't, what does, the, what does the Bible say? You know, train up a child in the way you should go. So when he grows old, he will not depart from what you've taught him. And you know that you violate that, you will pay the consequence. It doesn't mean that grace will not be available to you. But you can avoid a lot of heartaches if you only follow God's blueprint. And it explains why we got a lot of broken families. We never follow God's blueprint. But why are you supposed to do this? This is very important. We need to bring our identity to our parenting and not derive our identity from it. Do you get this? Your identity in Jesus Christ? You do not derive your identity from your kids. Because if your kids falter, you think that you've been a failure as a parent. You, 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 yeah, you get my drift? But if you derive your identity from Christ, regardless of what happens, you must parent based on what Christ has given to you. What's the Bible text that goes with this? We kind of go over this before. Colossians 3.17 Whatever you do, whether in word or deed, do it all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through Him. Is parenting part of this text? Why do you parent? Not to have impressive kids, not to have an impressive homes. That's a bad motive. That's not the incentive of the Bible. The Bible says whatever you do in word or deed, do it in the name of the Lord Jesus. You do it for Jesus Christ. So whether your kids fail or succeed, it doesn't matter. What important is you have been faithful to Jesus Christ. Oh my, this is one of the most powerful illustrations Dr. Eggerich gave. And that's my last slides for today. Remember Luke 15? When, jo when Jesus told the story of the prodigal son? Father had two sons. One kid was a derelict, went to the world, immoral, did his thing, loose living. You know, that guy, the prodigal guy. He had another kid who was so hung up on his self-righteousness. He didn't want to go inside the party. So both were prodigals, right? One was self-righteous, the other one went to the world, eating with the pigs. This is the question. This is the question of Dr. Eggeridge. Would anybody care, would anybody care to invite that father? Would anybody care to invite that father to have a Christian seminar on parenting? All right? <laughs> You follow me? He said, I hope you get, you get the, the impact of what he said. Look at this father. He's got a kid who went to the world, you know, wasted all of his living, you know, and lived with prostitutes and all. And he's got another kid who's so hung up, so judgmental, everybody goes to hell except for him. He's the only good guy. Can you use that father to be a model parent in your Christian seminar? <laughs> that's what's the question of Dr. Agur. It says, that's why it's very important to see. He said, do not derive your identity to what, based on what happened to your kids. Derive it from your identity with Jesus Christ. What do I say? How does the story of the prodigal end? You know that, right? Father runs and embraces the kid, takes him home. So there are two audiences that we like to address in this lesson for this week. The first audience is if you can reach your kids as early as you can, and teach them the ways of God. The promise still stands. Train up a child in the way you should go. And when he grows old, he will not depart from the training of the Lord. You will have less heartaches. But if in fact the enemy just attack your kid and life is messed up, families are broken today, is there still grace? Yes, you bet you. Look, 15 says, God's grace is still there. All right? And I got to say this. A lot of parents I know in church who, was, who went with their kids to you know, church every weekend, wearing pathfinders or, or missionary activities. They went on mission trips. Some of those kids are not in church anymore. Is it possible for you to do all that you needed to do? 
to follow God's blueprint and still have a kid like that? You read the Bible. There were good kings with evil parents. There were evil parents with good kings, right? You read the story. Because really, everybody's, everybody will have to have their own personal relationship. In the, in the final analysis, at the end of the day, you don't decide for the salvation of your kids. You decide. They decide for their own salvation. But the point is, even if they get messed up in their lives, grace is still there. Because you know what I tell the parents who comes to me and cry? Supplicate. You cannot treat your kid the way you treat a child before or a teenager because your kid is an adult. The best you can do for your kid right now is to pray. And let me suggest, when I do that, I pray that the Lord doesn't break them too hard before they're taken back. Because the Lord needs to break you in order for you to come back. Lord, please, don't break them too hard. I know you love them. You will reach out to them. But I'd like to end in that note. Was this an ideal father? Yes. Ideal father, not in terms of the principles that we did. I'm pretty sure he probably did that. But the kid turned out to be really bad. Okay? He's an ideal father because he is what he is, a compassionate and a gracious father. That's why I'd like to end with this verse. Okay? Someone would... 3, 13, and 14. Before that, Ricky wanted to, you wanted to make a no, comment. He answered the question. Yeah. I was going to ask about, do you think David was a good father yeah. to Absalom? Uh, I mean, Absalom yeah, so, yeah, yeah, sure. Uh, I learned that uh, yeah, people are saying, hey, let's, let's have a massive campaign for Christian education. So you got to send our kids to Christian schools. We have not, we failed to emphasize that because it's the time we should reach them. Oh, no, but I want to buy a brand new car, buy a big house because... Education is free. Let me just throw them into the public school system. You know, gone are the days. I told them in the Filipino culture, in Asia, parents will die just to have their kids go to Christian schools because they know the risk of not teaching their kids while they're growing up. The best gift that my parents gave me and my friends' parents gave them was to sacrifice all they can so they can be trained in a Christian environment. And we fail to see that now. I mean... You gotta admit, look, look at the church. They'd much rather enjoy the world and the luxuries than, yeah. You know, we're, uh, uh, according to God's word, all we have is, is, is given to us by God. He mm -hmm. owns it all. Mm -hmm. And if we misuse what he gives us, it, it, like he told Israel, if you are obedient, this is what you'll have. And if we begin, if we listen to earlier, he, 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 he spoke about, when Israel was disobedient, he stripped them yeah. of what they had. And so if we're disobedient with what God gives us, he will strip it from us. And it, what, what will become what was a blessing and a gift from God to us will yeah. become a curse. Sure. And, 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 and so, you know, I... I so I have, a friend, I have a friend in Hinsdale who happens to be a Christian psychiatrist. Uh, he was part of our move to make it a K-12 school. Uh, and he was telling me, Bing, I don't understand why these parents don't want to invest in their kids early. <laughs> Instead of sending their kids to me now to pay hundreds of dollars per session for an hour. Just because he's an addict, I need to, you know, <laughs> win him back and redeem whatever is left in his life because he's got messes in life. You got to go to psychiatrists to have those sessions and pay hundreds and hundreds of thousands of dollars because they wanted to save some dollars and buy whatever they wanted to give all the luxuries to their kids. I mean, he explained it to me, Bing. He said, why, 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 why do much rather pay for your disobedience to God than to follow his way? But that, that, that's what... One is trying to say. But I'd like to end with this text. I'd like this because I still think the epitome of our lesson is the other side of the story. Just as the Father shows compassion to his children, so the Lord shows compassion to those who fear him. For he knows our frame. He remembers that we are dust. Let me submit this to you. As good as these principles are, I would like to submit to you that even Dr. Emerson Egerich violates them. You know what Emerson Egerich said? There was one day when my husband was maltreating me. I got his book 
and wave it on his face. What do you think the author of the book will tell you how you treat your wife right now? <laughs> you know, that's, that's, what, that's what he said. Why? Because we're sinners. I'm telling you, we need God's grace. And if we need God's grace, our kids need Christ's grace as well. And I'd like to end there. I think the good father in the end is the reflection of the father who says, regardless of what happens to you, I'll give you compassion. I will give you grace. But it is still true what he said. But you can avoid heartaches. If you follow my blueprint, the closer you are to my blueprint, the better it would be. I mean, with this illustration, uh, Dr. Emerson Hagerich was invited by the New York Giants football team to, to speak to them. And then he finally found out from the coach of the New York Giants, you know, Eli Manning is the quarterback of the New York Giants. Uh, Dr. Hagerich, this is what we do. Before any football game, we have a game plan. And Eli knows he's going to be on his butt, so he'll be sacked. We'll miss out on plays. But what I tell my team, it doesn't matter what happens as long as you stick to the game plan. Oh, dudes, our games as parents, as children, as families will fail because we're sinners. But God's game plan for us is perfect. You got agree? And all we need to do every day is to stick to God's game plan regardless of what happens. And then, you gotta understand, why will I stick to God's game plan? Because he never makes mistake, and more than that, he's a very gracious God. So that if I get sacked, and if I lose a down, he's still my dad, he's gonna be with them for me. And I like to end on that note, okay? But so, this, this lesson is so rich, there's so many principles you can follow to avoid all those heartaches. But even if you have heartaches in the end, God's grace will still be with you. And that's the kind of God we have. Cool? All right. Let's close with a word of prayer. Dear Father, thank you for a wonderful lesson. Very practical principles you've given. And if you will only trust your heart and your compassion and your grace and your kindness and love towards us, we will avoid a lot of heartaches. And yes, Lord, we are sinners. And there, there's no failing. We will trip one of these days. We'll violate some of these principles. We can only thank you that even in troubled times, because we've disobeyed you, your grace is still there. But we only pray, dear Father, that the grace that saves us will be the same grace that will lead us home. So remind us of your graciousness every day. At the same time, may your grace empower us to be good parents, good children, good members, good uh, members of the community and the church, so that we can do things to spread the word of the gospel and these biblical principles that your name may be honored. And we can find our family honor your name as well. And when everything is said and done, we will know what it means to say that you love us and you are our Father. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.